everybody! T. Kingfisher here, and I'm about to do a reading. Uh, it is supposed to last about 15 minutes, according to the guide that I've been sent, and uh, so let's see how far we get. This is a weird little story that I've been fooling around with, probably a novella, I don't know, maybe a very short novel, it's so hard to tell. Uh, they, you know, 40,000 words versus 45,000 words, and you always get there and think, I could use the extra 5,000 words, and then it's a novel, and then you're sunk. Um, I don't think we have any content warnings on this. Uh, there may be swearing, I can't actually remember, and if it goes long enough, there will be some violence. But for the most part, it is just a odd, silly little thing that I have been noodling around with, and someday I will write this book and it will be finished, and it's sort of my... Uh, a tribute to Diana Wynne Jones, I guess, uh, for lack of, of any other useful thing to say about it, uh, except that I've always wanted giant writing parrots in a book, so. All right. It also doesn't have a title. It's just the floating house thing. Uh, one dock in progress, dock, no really dock. Eventually it will be floating house five final dot no really final dot no i mean it final dot doc x so that is how writers name their files i am afraid we have a tiny problem said cousin amelia this statement did not generate as much concern in the parlor as she perhaps might have wished the old woman knitting on the couch did not look up nor did she take her feet off the table the middle-aged woman wrapped in a shawl did glance up but only to say if it's only a tiny problem, then surely you can handle it? Cousin Amelia wrung her hands. She was the youngest of the three, and she knew that she was very silly, which was a source of some concern for her. It may be a slightly larger problem than that, she admitted. Is the house on fire? asked the middle-aged woman, whose given name was Malaria, and for obvious reasons insisted on being called Mel. Oh, no! Well, not that I know of. I don't know that it isn't, you understand, but surely we'd have noticed. She had to stop and press her hands against her cheeks. It'll be all right, a Amy said Mel kindly. Take a moment. Do you need tea? Oh dear, the house is floating, blurted Cousin Amelia. On water? asked Mel, with interest if not concern. Has there been a flood? That'll put out the fire at least, muttered the old woman into her knitting. Cousin Amelia wrung her hands together again. They were still smooth as a child's, the tendons only faint shadows on the back. There's no water. It's floating in the air. The old woman put down her knitting. She was Amelia's aunt and Mel's great aunt and was generally called Auntie Marsh. Everyone in the family had been defined by their relationship to Mel's mother, and now that that worthy was dead, it seemed far too much trouble to renegotiate everyone's titles. Floating in the air, she said. I was looking out the window to see if I could catch the postman delivering our mail, so we'd stop delivering it next door, you know, and it's gone, said Amelia. Of course it's gone, said Auntie Marsh. They're stealing it. If they steal it, they're putting it in the mailbox next door when they're done with it, said Mel mildly. Not the mail, said Amelia. The rest of the street. That's what's gone. Mel stood, smoothing down her skirts. She was five foot six in her stocking feet, but people always went away with the impression that she was very tall. She could generally be relied upon to take charge in any given emergency. Let us see about this, she said. Floating, said Auntie Marsh. But it is, said Amelia mournfully. That is, I hope it isn't. I hope it's just me being foolish, but it seems to have come completely out of the ground all the way to the garden gate. That's a relief, said Auntie. I'd hate to have lost the garden. How much of the front do we have? Cousin Amelia shook her head. To the road, but not all of it. More in the back, I think, but I couldn't see over the fence. We shall check the back first, said Mel firmly. Auntie took her enormous black boots off the table and set aside her knitting. Let us see about this. The trio tromped or tripped or strode to the kitchen, each according to their preference, and lined up, looking out the window into the garden. The garden continued normally to the fence, a neat little potager and a rather untidy flower border. The fence was too high to see over from inside. Doesn't look any different, said Auntie doubtfully. Except there used to be a fig tree over in Mr. Potts' yard, said Mel, and it's not there any longer. And I don't see the church steeple either. She opened the kitchen door and stepped out. Oh, do be careful. I shall be extremely careful, she said over her shoulder. 
It was very quiet. That was the first thing she noticed. It was extremely quiet, the way that it is after a snowfall. There was no wind at all. She had been thinking that Amelia had gotten rather more silly than usual, or perhaps eaten something that didn't agree with her, but suddenly she wasn't so sure. She walked to the back gate and opened it. There should have been a little bit of alley there, where the trash cans went on Tuesdays. Instead, there was about six inches of pavement, and then the world fell away, hundreds or even thousands of feet down. Mel found herself looking at a patchwork bit of countryside. Tiny white dots might have been grazing sheep. Or they might be mammoths, she thought, or giant snails. If our house is now floating in the air, who's to say the world below us is the same world as it was this morning? The house seemed to be moving along at a good pace, judging by how the landscape slid away underneath. Mel held on to the gatepost. She was a little bit uneasy of heights without actually being afraid, but it was so far down that it did not seem like a height at all. A silver wiggle of river shimmered off in the distance. She stepped back and carefully closed the gate. She did not stride as briskly as she went back to the house. She was suddenly terribly aware of the ground under her feet. How thick was it? An inch? Six inches? Ten feet? What was holding it together? There was moss between some of the paving stones, and Mel had a vision of the ground being held together by tiny moss filaments. Would her weight tear them apart, and would she fall through the ground and into the sky? No sense thinking like that, she told herself sharply, but she still found herself walking as if it was possible to avoid putting her full weight down on the ground. We appear to be floating, she told the others in the kitchen. It's the damnedest thing, said Auntie. Out front, too. I went and looked out the front door. The mailbox is hanging sideways, and we've lost the petunias around it. She scowled. I started those from seed myself. We're quite far up, said Mel. I don't know how far. It's hard to tell. Auntie Marsh started to sit down in a kitchen chair, then suddenly bolted to her feet again. The chicken! She ran for the back garden. Mel reached out to catch her, then sighed. Do you think the chicken fell off? asked Cousin Amelia. We should be so lucky. They went back to the back garden. Auntie was kneeling beside the house, gazing into the small chicken coop. Two baleful bird eyes gazed back. Hello, baby, Auntie crooned. Are you a good chicken? You're not upset, are you? To Mel, she said, I think we should bring her inside. The chicken does not come inside, said Mel. I do not care if we are floating through a rain of hellfire and dragons. The chicken is an outdoor chicken. You're a hard woman. It's a hard chicken. Don't listen to her, baby. Your mama's good little chicken. The chicken scuffled at her straw. That chicken nearly disemboweled Miss Wentworth's mastiff. He was scaring her, and he was fine. After 40 stitches, don't fight, begged Cousin Amelia. Please, we're miles up, and normally if you start fighting, I go to the market, but I can't because I don't know where the market is now. Mel sighed. Sorry, Amy. Auntie Marsh grumbled but left the chicken where it was. She insisted on opening the gate again, however. Mel made her way cautiously to the fence beside her. The old woman studied the ground far below and said, Huh. Any ideas? asked Mel in an undertone. I figure there's a good chance I'm dreaming, said Auntie. She knelt and prodded the edge. A pebble detached. Sorry, the problem with recording in the garden is that occasionally leaves and bugs fall on me from overhead and then I have to, you know, try to dust them off without interrupting the flow of reading. So my apologies. Also, if a rooster starts yelling, uh, yeah, that's not part of the book. That's, we have roosters. Don't poke it too hard, said Mel. I'm hoping I'm dreaming too. But ideas other than that? Auntie shook her head. They latched the gate and made their way slowly back to the house. Do you think it's the boiler, asked Cousin Amelia. It was making the oddest sound the other day, and I know that man came out and said he fixed it, but I don't think boilers can cause a house to come untethered from the ground, said Mel. Mind you, I'm not sure what can. This is all very peculiar. She rubbed her hands on her arms. It was cool, but the air was still. Have you noticed there's no wind? But we're very high up, said Amelia doubtfully. Shouldn't there be wind? Or are we not really high up at all? Oh, that's easy, said Auntie, shutting the kitchen door behind them. There isn't any wind because we're traveling with it. The wind is blowing and we're going at the same speed it is. Told you there'd be a rooster. It's like being in a hot air balloon. Except hot air balloons are lighter than air, said Mel, and our house definitely isn't. To say nothing of all the dirt and rock and the foundations and so forth. She wondered how much had come out of the ground. Were the pipes still there? This led to the further unpleasant thought that the water might not be working or would not be much longer, and how were they going to flush the toilet? 
She was just wondering this when Cousin Amelia filled the teapot. The water came out of the tap and kept on coming without so much as a gurgle. Amy, you're a treasure. Mel hugged her with one arm. Cousin Amelia looked baffled, but properly gratified. I thought we might want some tea? I can't imagine how the pump is working, but apparently it is. The electricity's on too, said Auntie, and don't ask me how. Do we still want tea? Indeed, said Mel. I think I could use a cup right now. We all could. With mugs of tea in hand, they went around and looked out all the windows. The view did not change significantly. It appeared that a chunk had been taken out of the ground shaped like a slice of pie with the tip cut off. The largest end was along the back fence and it tapered along the sides of the house, reaching its narrowest point at the mailbox, where it was barely wide enough to contain the front walk. The oleanders that had flattened to the front walk were completely absent and Auntie was rather bitter about it. They regrouped in the kitchen. There's no help for it, said Mel. We shall simply have to search the house. Something's causing this. Is it magic, do you think, asked Cousin Amelia? It might be, said Mel, but I suppose it could be some sort of device. They invent all kinds of things these days. Probably there's houses vanishing all over the country, said Annie, Auntie bitterly. The government's covering it up, mark my words. Probably they're the ones stealing our mail. I hope Mr. Pot waters my poor oleanders, if the government doesn't take them too. I can't imagine the government wants oleanders badly enough to make houses vanish, said Mel. Not when you can buy them at the garden shop for five dollars a piece. She frowned. Perhaps we should investigate the house and see if anything unusual turns up. It was an odd little house. Mel had lived in it for 18 years, exactly half her life, and she had thought it was odd the first time she laid on, eyes on it and had gone on thinking so the longer she lived there. The footprint was rather small, but it expanded outward as it went up with a wing hanging over a narrow porch on the left side of the house and a truly ornate and fantastical roof. If you stood at the mailbox, which was not currently recommended, you had the strong impression of an elderly woman bent over a cane and wearing an elaborate hat crust crusted with gables and cornices and a widow's walk that went nowhere in particular. It was not a large house even so, but it had many hidden nooks and crannies. In 22 years, they still hadn't found the door that led into the widow's walk, and Mel was half convinced that there wasn't a door and that it was a mere architectural folly. She couldn't be entirely sure though. The attic was stuffed with junk, most of which was her mother's, but some of which had come with the house. Mel's mother had never thrown anything away if it had sentimental value, and she had been a woman of enormous and frequent sentiments. It was entirely possible that there was a painted over door behind an old armoire or a pile of empty boxes labeled important keep. She wondered if her mother had tucked away anything that would cause a house to randomly take flight years after her death. It's certainly possible. It could be between the wedding pictures and the clothes from when Cousin Amelia was a toddler and the commemorative plates. It might even be a commemorative plate. I have no idea what a flying spell looks like, assuming it is a spell and not something mechanical. Mel had a vague feeling that a mechanical device that would make the house fly would have to be rather large and perhaps have moving parts and steam coming out. All right, she said briskly, look for anything that seems completely out of place or that you don't recognize. What if we find it? asked Cousin Amelia worldly. Well, don't touch it, whatever you do. Mel frowned. It occurred to her that even if they did find a device next to the boiler, say, thumping away and steaming, turning it off might have a very detrimental effect. She hoped it had plenty of fuel, whatever it was. Of course, if it was magic, presumably it would last until the house got to wherever it was going, if it was going anywhere at all. You expected spells to have some sort of direction. Mel took another slug of tea, faintly amused at herself. Oh, you expect that, do you? You've never seen magic more impressive than the charm that Miss Wentworth got for her mastiff's collar to keep chickens away. Split up, said Auntie Marsh. We'll cover more ground that way. Bad things happen when people split up, though, said Cousin Amelia. That's when a monster picks them off one by one. There are no monsters in this house, said Mel firmly. I won't stand for it. Floating around is bad enough. If you see a monster, send it to me and I will deal with it. I'm not doing the basement, quavered Amelia. Don't look at me, said Auntie Marsh, who was frail when it suited her. Those steps were made to break hips. I shall do the basement, said Mel. The trio of women went off in different directions. Mel turned on the light switch at the top of the basement stairs, noting that the electricity was indeed still working, which was impressive given the nearest power line was far below them, and stalked down the steps. It was dark and dank and rather dingy, as basements tend to be. She had whitewashed it ages ago when she had first moved in, but it had acquired a layer of grime. The boiler squatted in the corner, but there were no conveniently unexpected devices around it. She went up and checked the switch that the repairman had installed last week. 
It had an on setting and an off setting, but no float setting. Well, it wasn't much of a theory, she muttered. She went up the stairs, checked to the kitchen cupboards, and was just about to empty out the storage closet when Amelia screamed. All right, I'll go on for just a little bit more. I can't leave you hanging there. The first scream was wordless. Mel shot upright so fast she nearly cracked her skull on the open cupboard door. The second scream was a coherent word. My monster shrieked Amelia. Mel ran up the stairs two at a time and skidded to a halt in Amelia's bedroom. Amelia had a hand crammed in her mouth and the other was pointing out the window. What? Where? Outside? Amelia nodded and made a little gargling moan around her fingers. Mel turned around, went down the steps three at a time, and flung the back door open. She grabbed for a knife out of the block as she went through the kitchen and threw open the back door with barely any loss of momentum. Then she saw what it was and stopped. The monster was at the bottom of the garden, just inside the fence. It had gigantic wings and had clearly just landed. It was green and feathered with a red face and huge dark eyes. Scaly feet tore furrows in the turf. Instead of teeth, it had an immense beak the color of bone. It was, it was, well, it was a giant lovebird and there was simply no getting around it. And I will stop there. Uh, I think we are going to a Q&A shortly after this. Uh, please don't ask me when it'll come out because I don't know it'll come out when I finish it. Uh, if people would like to read it, which hopefully they will. And uh, yeah, it, it has lovebirds and eventually elves and evil herons. Evil herons is a theme I return to a great deal in my work. I think herons scare me. Anyway, I will see you live in just a minute.